If you were in a conversation with someone who said, you know, all religions basically teach mostly the same things, they all end up at the same place, uh, there's really not a dime's worth of difference between this religion and that religion or between all these other religions and Christianity. How would you respond? How would you begin a dialogue or perhaps pursue a dialogue with somebody who said that? Maybe even a member of your own family who's turning away from an affirmation of Christianity. Well, there, there are a lot of ways that we can respond, and obviously we talk about some of these on Sunday mornings and Sunday school on Wednesday night. But I would encourage you always to keep your own heart, soul, and mind fixed on God himself and an understanding of God himself. And so part of the conversation, which would be applicable, would be to start talking about who God is in the Christian faith. He's unlike any other God. He's not the father um, of some other religion. He's not the multiple fathers of Hinduism. He's not Allah of Islam. He's God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So the triune God who in himself and of himself is love is distinct from any other God, so to speak, that people could turn to. But at the heart of that, you could begin talking and should, in fact, begin talking about Jesus, the Son of God. And, and part of talking about Jesus invites us to begin to share the gospel with people that, on the one hand, we are far more sinful and far more desperate for salvation than we can even ourselves begin to understand, to comprehend. But on the other hand, God is more loving and gracious that even Christians sometimes can begin to imagine that the Son of God became flesh, became one of us, took on our flesh and ultimately our death to save us. That's awesome, isn't it? And, and, and of course, point central of the story we've talked about in this series, um, the birth of Jesus on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. We're back to the birth now. We've talked about the Holy Spirit's conceiving Jesus within the Virgin Mary. And, and here we are at the point of our sermon series talking about the birth of Jesus. Charles Spurgeon puts it this way. Here he is, Jesus, infinite and yet an infant. I mean, try to get your mind around that. Infinite, yet an infant. Eternal, yet born of a woman. Almighty, yet nursing at a woman's breast. Supporting the universe, and yet needing to be carried in his mother's arms. Heir of all things, and yet the despised son of a carpenter, Jesus, no one else. So we're going to talk about Jesus today and his coming and return to some of the things, pretty much the sermon from Christmas Eve and Christmas Day supplement what we'll do here, particularly the Christmas Eve sermon, Unexpected. I encourage you, if you missed that, to go back and listen to that, and actually the whole service was beautiful. But today we're going to turn back to three passages of Scripture, a couple from the Old Testament, from Micah, uh, chapter 5, verses 2 through the beginning of verse 5, and then also to Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. They're, they're prophets from the same time period, over 700 years before Jesus' birth. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, and then we're going to move forward. Uh, in Luke chapter 2 today, after spending quite a bit of time in Luke chapter 1. So, hear now the word of God. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand 
and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. And he, he shall be their peace. And then to Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And now to what was prophesied. Luke chapter 2. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration before Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage, the line of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. While they were there, the time came, the days were fulfilled for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn or in the guest room. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. The angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born today in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ, Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased, those toward whom he has favor. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it marveled at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it was told them. And when the eight days were fulfilled to circumcise him, he also was called by the name Jesus, which he had been called by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Infinite, yet an infant. You, and I, but you, (laughs) need this, this, Savior. So we move from believe before dawn to now believe at dawn. Now we're believe at dawn as we move into chapter 2. 
part one, each of us needs a savior. Each of us needs a savior. You need a savior. The problem is, just like the old song says, most of us are looking for love in all the wrong places. We're looking for our answers, for help, for finding our identity, for, for transforming our identity <laughs> in all the wrong places. Most people look for salvation and redemption and dealing with their shame or guilt or their problems or their self-affirmation in all the wrong places. Just this past week, I had another one of these conversations that you know I periodically have, I trust you do, as you kind of get out and, and mingle with Mississippi State University students and God kind of providentially places them in your path. Uh, I was out running back this week when the weather was nice. I'm pretty much a fair weather runner, but I was running on one of those afternoons when it was nice. And um, there's a, a guy practicing soccer. My mom, actually, I take my mom with me sometimes so she can get out and walk a little bit when I'm running. Uh, she met him. He comes over to me. He says, so I understand you're a man of God. I said, well, I'm, I follow Jesus. And he said uh, he's a student. He's in about his third year at Mississippi State. And he starts telling me his story. He really wants to talk to me because he says, I've been needing to talk to somebody for the last year or so. He says, you know, I grew up in a church, in a Baptist church in his case, and he said, but, but basically by the time I was a teenager and started to head to Mississippi State, I realized that my pastor, my preacher, and a lot of the people that I thought were actually Christian, they were much more uh, animated about politics and talking about Donald Trump as the savior and all this kind of stuff than uh, saving our country than they were about like people's spiritual situation. And so I, I kind of left the institutional church, he said. Um, and he said, what happened is um, I started, he, he said, I started reading of Eastern Orthodox monks. Are you familiar with Eastern Orthodox monks? And, he, and I said, yes, I, I am. And uh, he said, well, I, I started reading, I, I, I think he's, he said he was reading Barsanufius of um, Gaza. And I said, yeah, yeah, I know Barsanufius. So he, he started talking about Barsanufius a little bit and said, he, I was reading him for months and uh, I was really trying to, you know, be spiritual looking to his writings. And he says a lot of really otherworldly things, and I said, yeah, I know that. And he said, um, he said, then all of a sudden, one time when I was thinking about all those words, I heard a voice say to me, I mean, I could hear this voice. He said, do you ever hear voices? And I said, yeah, sometimes I do. I actually have, you know. And he said, this voice said to me, call on my name. Call on my name. And he said, so I called on Barsanufius' name, and I just felt coldness. There was nothing going on. I, he said, you've heard voices before. Well, what do you think was going on? I said, well, I think what was happening was the actual Son of God, Jesus, was inviting you to call on his name that you might be turned towards salvation. And so this conversation went the way a lot of times conversations go, you know, he kind of turned to something else. He, you know, you're going to say, well, that, that, that doesn't follow, but it does. This is the way this typically works. He said, what do you think about the Roman Catholic Church and their crusade against the Cathars? I said, okay, so you want to talk about the Cathari crusade? I said, yeah, it was, it was really bad. He said, I said, it was, it was devastating. It's horrible. I mean, the Albigensian crusade against the Catharis, you know, in, in, in Europe and in France and in Spain was, um, was as bad as anything that the Roman Catholic Church did in crusades against uh, in, in the Middle East. There's no question about it. They killed all those women and children. It's horrible. I said, but you, you understand that's not Jesus. I said, Jesus teaches us a different way. Jesus says those who live by the sword die by the sword. Jesus is a different, you, you don't get confused with, with all that church history or Catholic history. I, I'm talking to you about Jesus the one who actually called your name. It wasn't Bar Sinufius. It wasn't Pope Innocent who, you know, motivated the Albigensian Crusades. It's, it's, it's the actual Son of God. I want to talk to you about the Son of God because he's calling you to himself. I'm convinced that this is an invitation from the Lord. I said, it's kind of interesting I'm having this conversation with you because in about five days I'm going to be preaching on something that directly pertains to this. Call on my name. 
I said, I want to talk to you some more. I'd love to pray with you right now. He's giving you the invitation. You want to go ahead and pray now? He said, no, but I'd like to talk to you again sometime. I said, okay, good. Give me your contact. I said, you need to come to church, and I'd love to get you in conversation with some of our other folks from the church. Call on my name. Call on my name. Uh, We have a domain awareness gap. Did you know that? That wasn't what I called it. I kind of knew it already, theologically and instinctively, but I didn't realize we called it a DAG uh, or a domain awareness gap until last week. And that's, of course, when um, four-star Air Force Lieutenant General Glenn Van Herc, you know, he's about the highest you get in the Air Force, right? Our Air Force, right? Best and the brightest. Commander of both the U.S. Northern Command and the Northern American Aerospace Defense Command. He's commander of both. You understand? This is a four-star general. He said um, when he's talking about, you know, all these unidentified flying objects that it turns out have been flying over us for the last number of years. It turns out this balloon thing was not the first one. And I don't know how we figured it out after the fact. But anyway, apparently these things have been coming from our good friends Xi and Putin and the Ayatollah Khamenei and all those folks who fly stuff over the Ukraine. It turns out they fly stuff over the United States, too, and we didn't even realize it until some farmers and photographers in Montana started taking pictures, and then suddenly our military was aware of it. That's kind of strange, isn't it? But anyway, yeah, so he said, look, he said, we did not detect those threats, and that's a domain awareness gap that we have to figure out, domain awareness gap. But you know the way government and military and even a higher educational institution works, you need to turn these into acronyms. So it turns out the military is already calling these things DAGs. This is, okay, we've got DAGs going on all around us. Our deadliest, if you're following along with the sermon notes, it's time to gear this up now. Our deadliest DAG, our deadliest domain awareness gap is what? Is what? What are you going to fill in the blank there? It's not balloons flying overhead. It's something that is within us, working within us. And it's called, it's it's three letters also, sin. Sin. And that's what the Bible calls it. The Bible calls it sin. But I know I'm, I'm speaking with a really sophisticated group that's into governmental stuff and higher education stuff, so I need to turn this into an acronym. So I'll say S period, I period, N period, which I would say is self involved narcissism, self-involved narcissism, self-centeredness, you know, just self-obsession, and that's sin. That's what sin is. And it turns out we are, because of our selfishness and self-centeredness and wanting to decide good and evil for ourselves, just like Adam and Eve, we are in rebellion and at war against God, our Creator, and against His kingdom and against the blessings he wants to give to your family and to mine, to our world. We've breached our relationship with God and with each other. And God is just. God is just. God is holy. God is also omniscient. He knows everything that goes on with our time, with our money, with our bodies with our minds, with our thoughts. And he's just and holy and good. He's good. And it turns out we've incurred a debt and are continuing to build interest on that debt that there's no way you and I can pay. I mean, we can't even get close to paying off this debt to God. You've ruptured a relationship that was your most important relationship with the one who made you. You and I have. And we can't repair that rupture. Without salvation, your soul is headed to an eternal death and darkness. And by the way, this sin of ours, this selfish, you know, self-involved narcissism, whatever you want to call it, it results in attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Yeah, we all have it, actually. And you know what? There's, there's something tonight that a ton of people are going to watch. I know most of you will be probably reading uh, Barsenefius or somebody else. But anyway, uh, there's, there's, uh, there's, there's, 
there's something tonight, and it's really important. I know it's important because it has big Roman numerals after it. You know, like it's the most august thing that's ever happened in world history. And that's called the Super Bowl, right? Isn't the Super Bowl tonight? Yeah. So, um, uh, listen, um, we're going to spend a lot more time watching the Super Bowl and watching Super Bowl ads, most people are, and people dancing and singing, you know, at this multi-billion dollar cost, uh, you know, entertainment extravaganza at halftime, then, then you're going to spend talking to God and thinking about God. That's the way it's going to work, okay? Because we have a, def- you know, we have a real attention <laughs> hyperactivity disorder going on here. Um, and, and we're missing. We have a domain awareness gap about the one who is above us and seeking to come into us to save us. You see, you need to be saved. Your soul needs a, you should be able to fill in the blank now. If you're following the sermon notes, I hope you can fill in the blank. Remember the sermon title? You need a what? You need a savior. Now, in the Greek and in the New Testament, this is soter, soter. We've hit this Greek word once before in um, chapter one of Luke, when Mary herself, you know, also Mary's really faithful, but she is a fallen human being like anybody else. And she she refers to God as her savior. She needs a savior, like, uh, but God is her savior. Not just any savior, but the one, it turns out, that God himself planned and promised to his covenant people. The one who can reconcile us to God, who can pay all that debt I was talking about, because he's in a different kind of position. He's God, but he also comes as one of us. I mean, he's, there's only one, only one, not just appearing as a human being, like in the myths or in Hinduism or something like that. I mean, actually one of us, yet God. And he brings to us the reconciliation of God's justice and righteousness on the one hand and love and grace and mercy on the other hand. Now, I I, I grant you there are a whole lot of false saviors out in the world. And I'll give you the par excellence pretty much from the time Jesus was born. Uh, The gospel of a political and commercial God. Um, And that is the man who was referred to as the savior of the whole human race. I mean, he was actually referred to as the savior. I'm not talking about Jesus yet. I'm going to get to Jesus. You're supposed to understand Jesus is contradistinction to this savior. He is the most powerful and the richest man on earth at the time of Jesus. And his name is Octavius, otherwise known as Augustus, the revered one. I talked about this on Christmas Eve. The Roman Senate had never given this this title to a human being, to a human being, until they gave it to Octavius Caesar, you know, the adopted son, the the great nephew of of, uh, Julius that Julius had adopted. They gave it to to Augustus. It implies uh, somebody who's worthy of reverence and worship, worship. And if you were a good Roman citizen and wanted your kids to go to the right school and you wanted to be in the right clubs and do well and get the, you know, the, get the highest education possible, man, you needed to bow down to Augustus. That's the way it worked in the Roman Empire. Augustus, and, and he deserved it, man. Augustus, you know, when you remember Cleopatra and all those cosmopolitan progressives, her whole group, you remember Cleopatra who seduced Julius and then seduced Mark Anthony, they were trying, those global elites, Cleopatra and them, they were trying to take over our Roman Empire. But good old conservative Augustus, he defeated Cleopatra. You know, she killed herself. Isn't that awesome? And defeated Mark Anthony. And you know what? He took back Rome for us. Amen. Now we're saved. And so he ushered in what was called the Pax Augusta, the peace of Rome. And man, you want to talk about great economic prosperity and peace all throughout pretty much the civilized world, that's Augustus, that's a savior for you. A political god, uh, you know, our kind of guy, you know, taking back Rome and the Roman Empire for us after Cleopatra was trying to mess everything up. In fact, the Praene inscription from 9 BC, looking back to when, at this point, the still living Caesar Augustus was alive, a few years before Jesus. Listen to this, I mean, this is an inscription. The providence which was ordered 
um, which ordered the whole of our life has ordained, in other words, the gods have ordained, the most perfect consummation for human life, giving it to Caesar Augustus. This is the ultimate human being. By sending him, as it were, a savior for us and for those who come after us to make war to cease, to create order everywhere. The birthday of the God, this means Augustus, was the beginning of the gospel. Gospel, good news, is Roman propaganda language. You have to understand this as you open Luke chapter 2. Talked about this on Christmas Eve. It's Roman propaganda language. The gospel for the world that came by Augustus. That's the praying a um, inscription, right? Language of the imperial cult of Rome. And then we get to Luke chapter 2, and we get to the irony. I talked about it on Christmas Eve. Remember this. Basically, God apparently says, okay, I raised this guy up. He's established the peace of Rome so that in a few decades we'll be able to spread Christianity to all the continents. Okay? But in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and use him one more time before he dies. It's time for my son to come. And you know I planned for my son to be born in Bethlehem. I'm going to use this Augustus, tweak it a little bit. He's going to get via a dogma that goes out that Herod institutes in his little kingdom. And I'm going to get Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem and the beginning of the dawn. As I said, Christmas Eve, this is the only time Caesar Augustus is in the Bible, no more. <laughs> he served his purpose. As it turns out, he was just there, apparently, for this purpose. Isn't that amazing? To serve higher purposes. But you know what? The people watching the Super Bowl won't get that. Most of them won't. Satan doesn't get that. Satan's got a domain awareness gap, praise the Lord. Isn't that good news? Ours is not so much good news. We pretty much both missed the whole thing, because Satan's in our respective dag uh, misses the true Savior's arrival. I've got three blanks for you there. Let's work through those. So what did Satan miss? It just makes no sense to Satan how God operates. I mean, Satan's like, man, I am at work in Washington, D.C. I'm at work in the, you know, in uh, Silicon Valley. I'm at work, you know, in Hollywood. I've got pretty much, I've got, you know, the Kremlin pretty much wrapped up. Uh, the Ayatollah and his boys, I've got them, you know. Satan's like, man, I've got everything under control. But you know what doesn't make sense to Satan? The mustard seed kingdom. So how does the mustard seed kingdom work? How does God work? Baby. Seriously, God is going to come as a baby. Satan did not have that cover. He's looking at Caesar Augustus and distracted. He's looking at the Super Bowl and distracted. He's looking at the halftime show and distracted. And we've got a baby that nobody even thought about coming. And where? Bethlehem. Bethlehem? Seriously? Let me ask you this. In the Bible, how many times after David is king and in his palace in Jerusalem, how many times does he go back to Bethlehem? How many times is it listed in the Bible? Let's see. Count it up. Zero. Bethlehem's in the Bible occasionally, you know, with prophecies and during the time of, um, you know, the escape in Jeremiah to, to Egypt. That's about it. David never takes his Corvette and parks it in Bethlehem and hides, you know, secret documents there. He just does not hang out at Bethlehem. You know, and so Satan has long since forgotten Bethlehem. But there, there's, the baby comes in Bethlehem, this little hick village with a bunch of sheep. Really? Yeah. And, of course, you know this one's coming. Manger, where the animals eat. Really? I mean, Satan had everything else covered. He had all the halls of power covered. He had all the communication lines covered. He didn't have that covered. Unfortunately, neither did we expect God to work like that. We still don't sometimes, even though we got it right here in front of us. Um, God doesn't come in Jesus as the cosmic, you know, superstar the person we're all listening to on our electronic devices, he comes as the baby laid in the manger. And the angel said to the shepherds, um, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. 
Euangelizo, okay, is the term there, the verb there. We've had it already back when Gabriel gets on to Zechariah and says, you have not believed, you have not believed this good news that I was bringing to you. Now we have it again here. Uh, this is, I'm guessing, I'm thinking this is Gabriel, the angel of the Lord who appears and says, yep, yep, here it is, the good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Now, on its face, this means all the people of God's people, like Israel, okay? But it turns out there's going to be more. God has more people than just Israelites. Isn't that cool? Anyway, um, for unto you, we're supposed to hear the um, Isaiah 9, 6, unto you a child is born unto, okay, uh, for unto you is born today. I mean, what Isaiah was talking about over 700 years ago is happening today. Today. A somebody who is Christ, somebody else. Now here we get the configuration of three terms that you've just got to know, and we kind of know them, but you've got to pay attention to them, okay? Uh, unto you is born in David's city. We've talked about Isaiah 9, Micah 6. Um, Unto you is born today a, you got to be able to fill in the blank. Come on, remember the sermon title? What is it? A Savior. Okay, who is this Savior that we need so much? Well, um, the two terms here, actually in the Greek, they go together after Savior. But let me just say this about Savior. Remember Mary said God is her Savior? In the Old Testament, God is the Savior. Salvation belongs to God. So if we're saying this baby is the Savior, not, not just simply an instrument of salvation, he is the Savior, what did we just say this baby is? God. When Mary in the Magnificat, she talks about God, her Savior. This baby now, the angel is telling the shepherds, is the Savior. But we get even more, right? He is also, you gotta understand this, he's the Messiah of Israel, and he's the Messiah of Israel, and that term leads, bumps into the next term, kurios, okay? Christos, kurios. It is not some text trying to clean this up, say, um, Christos, kuriou, okay? But, but it's not that. It's not the anointed Messiah, okay? It's the Messiah and lore. Go to Bruce Metzger, the best textual critic in, in the entire history of the New Testament. He says, yeah, the dominant manuscripts prevail here. That's clearly what's being said. In other words, let me explain this to you. The Messiah is also God. So you got it on both sides of this little collision of three terms here. And nobody else can save you like that. You need a savior that big. A savior who is the Messiah of Israel, fulfilling all the covenant promises, and in fact, God himself come to you. That's what the, that's what the Bible is saying. So we are called to believe God's gospel of great joy for all his people. And it's not just Jews, it turns out. It's for Gentiles, too, of Israel's Messiah. That, that's filling in the blank there. Israel's Messiah. We have a present fulfillment now. And the Messiah is also, I've already told you, right? God. The Messiah is God. The Son of God. Now, remember the step down to step up parallelism I've talked about with John's story and Jesus' story in Luke 1 and 2? Here we have it again. Notice, remember, when John's born, he's born in a nice house with well-established people and all the family and friends come and have a big old celebration and are kind of amazed with him. And that's really cool. When Jesus is born, are there a lot of friends and family just coming in and saying, this is awesome, this new baby? No. Step down, but then we step up. Because guess who's so excited? The entire heavenly host is going wild about Jesus, right? And, 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 and the skies basically are broken open. The heavens are broken open. And the heavenly host is rejoicing about Jesus. And then they lead to the shepherds. You're, you're supposed to catch this parallelism. The angels are praising and glorifying God in verses 13 and 14. And in turn, after the shepherds see Jesus, 
they also glorify and praise God. Got it? They're both doing it. So we're supposed to do what the angels do. The shepherds get the message. And of course, Jesus in front of them inspires them to do this. Now here we are at the turn of all history. And we've got a question. Do you want the world's peace? I hope not. The world's peace is, is a joke. Do you want your peace that you're going to work out for yourself? Maybe reading Eastern monks and their writings and trying to figure it out for yourself over there? Or do you want the real Savior? On earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased, literally those favored by God, graced by God. God gives peace by grace to you. That's the invitation. And here's the further invitation. There's no distinction between Jew or Greek. Youth, y'all are about to get to this in Romans 10. Okay. Romans 10, 13. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And what is that name? Come on, Christians. What is the name? Jesus. Jesus. Believe his name. Now, when the eight days were fulfilled to circumcise him, um, he was called by the name Jesus. That's fill in the blank there. Uh, you know, a few years ago on the other side of our church, you know, needing to make some decisions and moves and whatever, I preached about my first or second year here on this Christmas, on the Sunday after Christmas, about the circumcision of Jesus. And I pointed out, hey, this is the first time Jesus sheds blood. It's a type pointing to the cross and the atonement for us. This is all set up prophetically by God. And I actually had personnel committee members come to me and say, some of the members don't like you talking about stuff like that. You know, that's, and I said, it's in the Bible, and he's, he's our Savior. Like, you have to understand this to understand salvation. And they said, yeah, but it makes people uncomfortable when parts of the Bible we don't like here. And I'm so glad we've been set free from that. You know what? So let me just tell you up, up front, he sheds his blood. He is circumcised. And this is a type pointing to the cross, okay? In our place, okay? This, this is what the circumcision was all about on the eighth day, fulfilling the covenant, right? And being named Jesus. What does that name mean? It means the Lord Savior. Or it can mean the Lord's salvation. It can be translated either way. Yeshua be translated either way. But either way, Salvation belongs to the Lord. The Old Testament keeps telling us over and over again, the Lord is the Savior, the Lord God is the Savior, and this baby is that Savior. This is the Savior you need. He's come all the way down to earth to be born and to be placed in a manger and to be circumcised on the eighth day and to prepare to go to the cross for you. Call on his name. You need this Savior. Believe, as the New Testament says, in the name of Jesus. What his name means and call on him fully and be saved. Just like I'm going to continue to invite my friend to, like I did in a text yesterday. Love to get together with you. Let's talk further about Jesus. Call on his name. Your children call on his name. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.